man recognized the importance of fire at a very early date. While we can't presume to know when humans began using fire to selectively create environmental advantages, we do know that for many thousands of years, selective burning was universal. But only now are we beginning to piece together how pervasively and how early he employed fire to change and maintain his natural surroundings. Northern Alberta is bushland, part of the Canadian boreal forest, or taiga, where the fires of spring have been a major environmental factor for controlling the diversity and abundance of plants and animals. Because of its relatively recent isolation, Northern Alberta provides an excellent source of information for traditional Indian knowledge of burning. And there's two lakes. There's a, they're not very big. That's where they used to water. It was, it was a good country for the mufflers. They used to burn places where they think it was very useful. Like, uh, for instance, like uh, the places where the horses used to winter in order to have plenty of good feed for them and grass. And then uh, where there's lakes, around lakes, where there's muskrats, so that they could uh, always have real fresh roots, you know. They, uh, they live on roots, grass roots mostly, to keep them nice and fresh. If they don't, uh, the roots will spoil and rot, you know, and then they'll die off every so many years. Places where uh, there's um, moose, and where the moose usually likes to roam around, they burn the brushes there, so that they'll have good uh, green leaves and things to live on in summer. And uh, places where the Indians live close to, you know, they, there'll be brushes, like you see around poplars growing in one place, eh? Well, that's where they used to burn it. Within a few weeks of spring burning, the physical signs of fire are all but obscured. The controlled light fire initiates an early, more abundant spring growth. It does not destroy it. And it is a type of growth preferred by herbivorous animals, both large and small, which are in turn the prey of carnivores and man. We used to burn when the more you got to like open, see, open prairie, but since you quit burn it will more uh, grown with everything bush because he don't he don't burn he tend to he just grown even like here around here just very long ago it's all open here all over like this here no willows no pop you have to make hay right here regions that were once a complex mixture of forest types muskeg bush and large grassland openings are now dominated by brush and trees. Historical records show that northern Alberta was previously in a more diversified and open environment than is now the case. The record also shows that it was maintained, perhaps even established, by traditional Indian burning. Since the law was made, you can't burn like you did before. The law started in 1932, after a bad summer forest fire had burned from Hay River right down to Indian cabins and Meander River. It burned out by itself. The rangers came and changed the law. Why there's, uh, the bush is so thick, he said, it's because since they stopped burning, the Indians stopped burning. The law, the, uh, the law passed. Years ago, it wasn't dangerous to burn prairies and meadows because there was so much less bush and dead trees then. But now, people can't burn so easy because of all that thick bush. The overall economic aim of spring burning concerned the regional distribution and relative abundance of game and fur-bearing species. 
the burning techniques employed by Indians of northern Alberta produced a much more open landscape than we now encounter. Names like High Prairie, Rose Prairie, Little Prairie, Hay Lakes, and Wild Hay River are anachronisms now, except, of course, for the squared agricultural fields bordered by an advancing forest. Paradoxically, it was the Indian custom of frequent light burning that had produced and maintained much of the land that white settlers were then able to farm. These open grasslands proved very attractive to the white settler, and he established his homestead on what he assumed was land in its natural state. The technology of spring burning wasn't generally adopted, and in subsequent years, such practices were suppressed by law enforcement agencies, with a result that uncultivated grasslands grew back into bush. About five miles from here, from the river, I guess, out up to there, you could see straight prairie right to Child's Lake and that timber. Mm -hmm. That little blue line. Again, from there, the same thing towards Boy. Rockling, Yeah, Rockling. You could tell all those prairies. Did you ever see those level prairies? My goodness, I even uh, remember myself. It was really prairie. I'm old now, but when I was a young man, the Meander River area was like a prairie. But it's all grown up now. Lots of bush and lots of trees where there used to be grass. The airport is three miles from Meander, and from here to there, it used to be all open grasslands, but not now. We always burn just before all of the snow melted before the ducks had started to nest. We didn't burn after the ducks had nested. We knew when to burn and when not to burn. The spring fires made good food for the ducks, and it was good for all kinds of other animals, too. In time, many animals go there. Some, like the beaver, about four or five years after. Especially the bear, because the new bushes of berries growing in the burned places. Bears live not only on leaves and other plants. They also live on berries. They eat all kinds of berries at any season. For the early practitioners of this fire technology, there was a very precise time for burning. Spring, when the grasses of a meadow were dry and the surrounding forest remained too wet to burn. Only rarely did burning ever take place in the fall, never in the summer.
At winter's end, new plant growth attracts herbivores. With cleared, blackened surfaces, spring-fired meadows are preheated and growth occurs several weeks earlier and more lushly than in surrounding areas. In the Canadian boreal forest, where summers are all too short, these areas of induced early growth become important to both animals and man. Did you talk about your own? They used to start burning when there was still snow here and there. Do you think it's difficult to come out of the And some of the youngsters even just ride on horses, you know, and they set matches, you know, and that's how they burn. They don't wait until it's really dry, because it's it's dangerous. And like in trap lines, there'll be just about two of them, and yet the fire doesn't. They, they don't, uh, the fire is not dangerous. They just burn the areas they want. Spring burning serve purposes other than just that of early, more abundant growth. It was used to fireproof settlements, to clear dead and down trees, the improvement of hunting and trapping areas, ease of travel, the maintenance and improvement of duck and geese habitat the reduction of mosquitoes and black flies, the improvement of berry patches, the provisioning of ready-dried firewood. Even aesthetic and religious reasons were important. The considerations for burning were as varied as the kinds of resources and types of habitats involved. In the Muskeke burn, what you get? You get wood, I mean, for wood too now, you see if you burn, you get a lot of wood. I mean, dry. Everything after you burn, like now we never burn in some places. You got a hell of a time to get the wood. Now you have to go long ways to get some wood. You never burn. So long go you burn when you get wood to any place. Like even right here now, if you burn all this one in the spring, you get a lot of wood. Close, but they don't burn. You get nothing. Yeah. In the spring, when there is still snow in the bush, that's the only time most people would burn the open places. It is then that people think that it is best to start the burning. There are a lot of places they don't burn. They don't burn all over. To start spring burning again, would be good for people because it would help a lot, like it was a long time ago. It would be easier for the people to trap and hunt around the burn along their trap lines. Sometimes the brush gets so thick that the dogs and sleds can't get through, so they burn it. And then in the fall, it would be good for the animals because they come to the burned area right away. Whereas prescribed fires were important with their effects of earlier spring growth and the subsequent abundance of plants during summer and fall, it was actually the distribution and local availability of scarce winter forage that provided the most important adaptive advantage. selective, carefully considered uses of spring burning throughout hunting and trapping areas added a significant measure of planning and predictability to the otherwise great uncertainties of winter survival. It was, by any definition, a form of resource management, a form of environmental manipulation that enabled northern Indians to maintain and improve the preferred habitats of selected animals. Lucy's, that's where there's rats, muskrat, that's where they used to burn. And um, where's there's heavy brush, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, windfalls and things like that. <clears throat> All the young trees will grow for 
to attract the animals, like moose and things. Where there's timber and moss, they don't bother because the fire lasts and lasts, and it's hard to put it up. And furthermore, for fur-bearing animals, like martins and things, link, that's where they mostly stay in wintertime, so they don't want to destroy them. They must be very wise, eh? Those people, that time. I am most impressed by the complexity and interrelations being emphasized by elders in any discussions of the use and effects of fire. The conceptual framework that ecologists use helps us to understand some of the dynamics and complexities of what is both an age-old tradition and a relatively new field of environmental science. A few of the meadows, the kinds of areas where woodland bison once grazed and were hunted, are still maintained by spring burning to provide feed for domestic animals, especially horses, which like hunting and trapping, are important to the image and reality of being Indian. Spring fires expanded the safe area around the settlement when snow and a far higher humidity in the bush made even an accidental outbreak manageable. But spring firing produced more than fire breaks. The meadows were cleared off, forcing an earlier, more productive, and more uniform growth. An excellent lure crop for moose, elk, deer, and bear. And the smaller animals, mice by the thousands, which in turn brought in predators such as lynx, coyote, fox, pine marten, even wolves, all valuable to the trapper. In light of this increase in available game, firing was not confined to the settlement areas in nearby meadows. Trappers fired meadows and sloughs along their trap lines every spring to assure next winter's bounty. The existing natural mosaic became more varied, and it continued to grow in complexity and variety. Fire was of particular importance for improving and maintaining the habitats of aspen and willow favored by beaver. In turn, muskrats feed on the rootstocks of cattails. As with many other plants, fire stimulates their growth and ultimately produces a larger population of muskrats. Ducks far prefer nesting on the fresh, more productive growth along the burned section of a lake shore. And spring burns were always set before nesting began. In all, it was a controlled system to initiate what ecologists call early succession, a period of increased growth. All of this was managed by people who had developed a complex technology of fire to assure a continued successful adjustment to the northern boreal forest. Much of what was involved in burning came down to considerations about this time of year, the six months and more of winter, much of it bitterly cold. The fires of spring helped ensure the relative bounty of summer, fall, and most important, winter. All of it added up to a carefully reasoned plan for coping with and manipulating the northern forest. It is kind of hard for people to burn nowadays. The way things are now, it would be hard to burn. It would be better to burn again because it would make things different for our people. For a couple of years now, there's hardly any more berries. Why should you burn when you come in fast? See? You grow in fast, but if you burn right away, well, you'll go right away. But if you don't burn, well, you don't, you don't, I mean, you don't, uh, you don't grow like that way. Some places where you get burned, you burn in a sprint, and maybe one week time, it's already, you can see everything grown clean. Trappers burned when they were on their way home from spring hunting. 
At that time of year, it was safe, and they burned because it made it better for them in the winter, with more animals to hunt and trap for. But that was years ago that they did all that. Nowadays, you can't burn on the trap line because it's against the law, and it's not so good as it was before. Why they call it buffalo prairies? There used to be a lot of buffalo there long ago. Once in a while, while they traveled there, you know, when they, he was still young, in his, from 11, 12, 13, they used to go down to get his groceries and things. But they used to see an odd one. There used to be a big prairie there. 